Welcome back to the Better Men, Better Ball Player Podcast. I'm your host, Trey Cobb. I want to thank you for joining us here on our 102nd episode where we get a chance to talk to Ryan McGinnis. Ryan McGinnis is the current head coach and athletic director at Kimberly High School in Wisconsin. He is the former head coach at Oshkosh North uh, as well as assistant coach at Xavier University. Uh, during his time, he has won nine Fox Valley Association Conference Championships, uh, one of them being the first ever in Oshkosh North history in 2005. He's won nine sectional championships at Kimberly, two state championships in 2007 and 2017. He's also been runner-up three separate times in 2008, 14, and 15. He's had over 30 players have gained all-state honors. He's a servant of the Wisconsin Baseball Coach Association on their executive board. He served as president as well on that board. Um, he is the newest ethics award winner from the ABCA. Uh, I've been fortunate to have both those guys on here. Just incredible, incredible people. Um, and you'll get to hear that through later on. Um, Coach McGinnis has also been an ABCA national convention speaker. He has been the district coach of the year three times. Has been as well as been the Wisconsin State Coach of the Year. He's been the ABCA Regional Coach of the Year twice, and has also been a member of the USA Baseball staff. And uh, just throughout this conversation, we touch base with a ton of things, um, and how he runs his program, the accountability, the beliefs, philosophy. And importantly, how he creates common knowledge, common vocabulary, the power of words, Coach McGinnis talks about, is phenomenal. Um, just loves his ways of discussing how he gets everybody on board with their expectations, with their knowledge, communicating so we're all on the same page. Um, if you ever want to get to know what your player's arm's like, he has a great idea for us, for us all. And again, it's centered around this common language, common vocabulary, getting everybody on the same page and communicating. Uh, loved his way of how he even talked about how to get everybody on the same page. And the daunting task it is, he gives a great illustration of what that kind of looks like and kind of how he helps people visualize what it means to get everybody on the same, well, let's just say, word. Really good. So just loved it. Um, going to thank him for a lot. Just like I got to thank our sponsor. I got to thank our sponsor, Netting Pros. Uh, we'll monitor the guys at Netting Pros are, are improving programs one facility at a time. Netting professionals specialize in design, fabrication, installation of custom netting for backstops, batting cages, dugouts, scoreboards, BP screens, and ball carts. They also design and install digital wall graphic padding, windscreen turf, turf protectors, dugout benches, dugout cubbies, and more. Netting Pros continue to provide quality products and services to many recreation, high school, and college fields, facilities, and stadiums throughout the country. Contact Will Monitor. Contact the guys at Netting Pros at 844-620-2707 or info at nettingpros.com. Visit them online at www.nettingpros.com or Check out Netting Pros on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn for all their latest products and projects. So, thanks to those guys. Thanks to them being Netting Pros. Thank you guys for hanging on. I know you're going to love this with Coach McGinnis. It's one of these guys that just speaks my language. We had a great conversation and really thankful um, for his opportunity, for his chance to help us all get better here today. So, here he is, Coach Ryan McGinnis. We've done, we've done good. I mean, we've pretty much stuck together and the kids have done a good job. And, and I think it's, uh, I think it's been a test of, of resolve for sure. But, but it, you know, some good things have come out of it for sure. I mean, how you, how you communicate and some of these podcasts and, and, you know, being able to do some things virtually and, and uh, having kids understand the, the importance of doing some of this stuff. You know, again, one of the things you kind of worry a little bit about is some of these, you know, some of these places kids don't come back. You know, they're not coming back out and, you know, they're choosing not to play or, or you know, work kind of took over. And, and I think I think it allows us as coaches to reevaluate saying, you know, we have to 
entice these kids to want to play, you know, and, and to want to be there and, and to make it worth their while. And I think that's something that you can do and, and still hold them accountable to certain values and certain um, traits and, and certain skill sets. Um, but we can't lose sight of the fact that without players, we don't have much, <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh yeah. So like, what are some things that you like to do? Like with, like, so it sounds like you're talking about like making it a good experience for the kids, right? Like, so like, what are things that you like to do to, to make a, a good experience for kids? Like it's going to entice them to want to be with in your program. Um, a, a lot of things, you know, I think, I mean, you mentioned leadership council before, so we have a unity yeah. council, um, of guys that I meet with, uh, depending on the time of year, usually it's, it's, um, once every three weeks, um, in, in the fall and winter. Um, and then after Christmas, then we meet once a week, um, and talk about a gamut of things. But I think the first thing you have to do to entice them is understand that it's their program. Um, and when I say they, that's everybody that's in the program, but especially the unity council, the unity council guys are the guys who are returning varsity guys who choose to make an investment, um, and be a part of this council. And so, you know, we create the, um, kind of the standards or the, the reasons that if you want to be here, here's what you're going to get out of it. You're going to become a, a more reflective you're going to get to know your teammates better. You're going to get to know your coaches better. Um, you're going to become uh, more adept with some leadership skills. Uh, and I use leadership word lightly because I think we throw that around nowadays. Like everybody's got to be a leader. Everybody's got, well, you know what, whether we like it or not, we are leaders in, in whoever we are. Um, we're leaders to somebody and, and usually more than somebody, but you're going to be more adept with skills that leadership that leaders possess or that quality people possess. Um, you're going to engage in, in conversations um, and you're going to be able to create the core values. This is that this program is going to live by this season. And so, um, you know, th that's number one, I think is that they own it. And we, as a staff, um, me being the head coach and, and our assistant coaches, we are, we are the end of the day gatekeepers that if our unity council is going to not uphold them, then we have to hold them accountable, you know, but then we're really in trouble, you know, then, then we have, we really have nothing if we're doing that. Um, so that's number one. Number two is with their voice in there um, in that unity council, what do we want to do? So what do we want our season to consist of and where are we going to go? And what, you know, not, not just like what games are we going to play, but, we're going to go to, you know, we went to Columbus, Ohio, when I was coaching at Xavier, there, Ty Brennan coaches at Olentangy Liberty High School right outside of Columbus. And uh, we played them. And Ty is a great guy. And his dad um, is an assistant there. Just an awesome dude and uh, great program. And, and I, we know we're going to play a quality program. We know there's going to be no shenanigans. We know we'd be able to use their facilities. So our kids are going to get a lot more out of it. So, mm -hmm. you know, we created some different things. We went to an Ohio, you know, and this is one of the things, you know, we think we know all the answers sometimes as coaches of what kids want. At the time, I thought the um, Reds were at home. The Reds ended up playing in Mexico <laughs> on this day, but I thought they were home. So this was in like January or something. And I say to our guys, we have Ohio State playing Michigan at Ohio State, or we have the Reds playing um, the Cardinals which one do you want to go to? And if we go to the Reds game, we'll go to the Montgomery and afterwards and get ribs and get a bunch of stuff. If we go to the Ohio state game, we'll find a good place to eat and just boom, unanimous. It was like Ohio state, you know, mm -hmm. we're going to the college game. And I was surprised by that. Um, I, I was all set to get the tickets. I almost bought the tickets thinking that's what they're going to pick. So just little thing. I mean, that's not a big deal. And it's not like that made their season, but you ask kids now from that team, what was and we went to, we visited the Capitol in Columbus. Um, and I made them, you know, I didn't make them do any arduous work in there, but I said, when we get back on the bus, I need one thing from everybody and you can't repeat one thing you take away that you learn from in there because mm -hmm. it's more than baseball. And, um, you know, so we went around, had fun with that and guys are racing to be the first one, they don't <laughs> want to, you know, have to remember 47 things, but, um, it's just fun being together. And I think that's why you and I are in that. I mean, that's what drew me when you texted the better, you know, better men better ball players. I mean, that's what it's got to be about, you know, and, and uh, it's both. And I think you need to have both to sustain a program. 
I don't want to be in a program where I'm just going to become a better man, but I'm not going to learn anything about baseball. We right. just talked about that earlier with college. I wanted to go learn baseball, and I was a, I was a great student. Um, I, mean, I got academic. I got a lot more academic dollars than I did baseball dollars, you know. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I was I wanted to go to a quality school. I knew I was going to take care of my studies, but that was a given. I wanted a I wanted a baseball program that was top shelf where I was going to learn and be pushed and be challenged and be in competitive environments and play against really good opponents that were going to stretch me and my team. And um, and so if we don't build both, I think we're fooling ourselves. And a lot of people run around nowadays saying, oh, you're going to be better in life and you're going to do all that. And that's important. But you need to do that while honing the skills. The platform we have as baseball coaches is baseball. Yes. When I taught English before I was an athletic director, when I was in the English classroom, we did some math. There were times where we'd factor some math in and do something fun. We did a lot of social studies because there's a big overlap there. Mm -hmm. um, I would bring, I would have the, the guys who were awesome in, in small engines and everything. I'd have in, in building houses and stuff. I'd have them bring in blueprints and let our class know this is reading too. And I'm not great at reading a blueprint. So if you think I'm some master up here who's just going to sit and spew out my knowledge, I need some guys in here to teach us how to read a blueprint because that's reading too. And so is reading directions on a game you just got for Christmas or how to put together the new phone you just got. And although you know, they don't even come in with directions when cell phones first came out, they had some directions with them, you know? And uh, so we talked through some of that stuff. And I think those go hand in hand. So being a better man and being a better ball player, you can't really have one without the other. Cause it, uh, we use the term ball player in our program. It's the greatest compliment you can get. A ball player is also a man, it's someone who loses with class and then wants to go to get better doesn't just shake hands and say, Hey, you're awesome. And then leave saying, okay, I'm going to go sit on the couch and do chill. Let's go back and get to work and then play some more. And, and that's one of the, you know, we try to play like with a ball and stick ball. So again, how does it go back to enjoyable experience? It's more than just hitting in a game. It's, it's the competitive environment of saying, you don't have to have the best swing. You don't have to be six, three, two, ten. You don't have to throw 90. Your spin rate doesn't have to be 9,427, you know, but yeah. you got to want to compete. And so we play stickball games. We have hitting leagues in the summer and we get those kids playing stickball games. And we create brackets and World Series. And a lot of those guys, when when the Division Three World Series was in Appleton, they would pick Salisbury yeah. or they would pick, you know, they'd pick Linfield, you know, or they would have Whitewater. And so, and, and then they'd also have Texas, you know, so you'd have Texas playing Linfield. And, and it's just a, they get to know the game a little bit. We give away tons of baseball cards. I'm a sports memorabilia collector. Nice. Um, so I just want kids to understand. They don't have to love it, uh, maybe like I do or have a passion like some people do. But they do have to respect the history of the game and what the game stands for. Um, hard work, rules, accountability, discipline, um, you know. So, you know, that, that's the way they call it, home plate, right? Home's a special place. And so we want them to understand that. So, a lot of that stuff, I think, makes it enjoyable when you can stretch them beyond just we're here and we and we want to get to know them. You know, we every day we do an attitude of gratitude. What's something mm. that you're thankful for? Um, and we do that every day. So we're just not saying it's important to have an attitude of gratitude, but that we really have to live it. And when we're gracious for stuff, life becomes a better thing to live because we can get down easy. And we can be hard, you know, so hard on ourselves and, and knock ourselves down. And we have a rule that when you watch video you have to say positive first about yourself. What do you see good first? So we try to flip the script of, we just got to, and, and we are, believe me, you know, and I've, I've grown and, and gotten much better as a coach and, and a person over the years. Uh, and there are times where I was probably too tough on guys, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm demanding. There's no question about it. Um, and, and that's probably because of the type of player I was. I had to work for every single thing I got. And I believe that's, the best, you know, the best thing I did, I remember the last game I played when we lost at St. Francis and I put my glove down before we went and shook hands. And I remember put my, you know, kind of tossing my glove in the grass, just saying, gosh, am I blessed? I knew I wasn't going to get drafted. I would have really felt blessed if I was getting drafted. I knew I wasn't <laughs> going to get drafted, um, but I had no regrets whatsoever. I mean, I put every ounce and fiber into the game that I possibly could. And I was so grateful that I stayed healthy that I stuck with it. I had a horrible freshman year in college um, I, before I left home for the summer, the head coach uh, who I ended up coaching with at Xavier. He went from St. Xavier where I played to Xavier. And, um, but he said, you know what, you might not be good enough to play here. You know, so you just had a horrendous freshman year and I thought you could play here. 
our other coaches have doubts. Your performance kind of left some doubts. So when you go home, you know, you may not want to come back. Um, you'll have opportunities if you come back, but you might not be good enough. And I put that on my batting gloves, those abbreviations. Um, and that drove me. And so it's easy to switch. I had some opportunities to go other places, you know, not like people recruit me, but I could have gone somewhere else and just sure. somewhere where I could have played or somewhere where I didn't play and just study and been closer to my girlfriend, who's now my wife. And I was like, no way, man, this is something I, I believe I can play. Um, and so those are things that, you know, you bring who you are as a player. I believe we have to overcome some of that stuff as a coach uh, that we don't just coach to the player we were. But some of that you just can't change, right? You, you know, I'm a, I'm a grinder, like it sounds like you are. Yeah. And it's like, man, we're going to – we do not need to be the most talented, but we are going to together, collectively, we are going to be the best dang team that, that anyone encounter because you ain't going to break us all, you know, when we're holding, when we're holding together. So um, – but we, we have to flip the script on that. And, you know, I don't know about you, but when I was in coaching college baseball, every single kid I recruited to any depth, where I made calls to like their counselor, high school counselor, or their high school coach, what's their biggest weakness? Every 100% of the kids are too tough on themselves. Mm. And that's a great quality to a point, but we have to be able to forgive ourselves and move on in this yeah. game and in life. You know, we can't just beat ourselves up all the time. So it's funny. It's funny you say that because that's, that's how my, that's, I, I think about that. I think about my son, you know, he's, he's 10, we 11 next month. And that's how he is. And they're both very tough on themselves because it's like, but yeah, we do. I got to flip the script. I got to overcome, you know, and, and, and I am, you know, trying to, and it's funny. Like I have this unique experience, you know, from where I went, I, I coached at this, at this Juco, I got a college, you know, 22 years old, you know, and just trying to set the world on fire. And, <laughs> and now coming back now, 15 years later, and I've already talked my wife, like two situations that I knew, like, I know how I'd have acted at 23, 24 years old and how I did like, and I was like, all right, I'll wait, I'll give him time. And I just kind of, I, I just, how I handle it totally differently. So yeah, overcoming, you know, like, yeah, like it's taking some time here. I'm 40, you know, having to figure <laughs> that out. But yeah, it, it, I, I totally, I'm totally with you, you know, uh, very, very similar, uh, working for everything and love the development part of it. Love the practice part of it because yeah, I, I just, that's what I had to do, you know? And, uh, but there's also there's also what we know there's so much more to people that they could get to with with that kind of mentality, you know, with guys that already have the tools. Well, one of the things and one of the things that we do is we try to everything that we do in our program, we try to have a line. Mm. So it should make sense. Like, oh, yeah, of course you, we would do it this way. And I'm not talking about like bunt defenses. Right. There's 52 ways you can do bunt defenses. Here's how we're going to do it. and Here's why. But it's going to align with other things in our program. But, you know, what we call if so, you know, to be a winner, I like that to a point, but I don't love I think it sends the wrong message to Joe Average on the street. We talk about being a champion and being a ball player and being a ball player is the greatest compliment you can get in our program because it means you are a grinder that you take championship reps. So we have a champion's playbook. And um, we talk about, well, how do we take our reps? We take championship reps. So sometimes that means I was a guy who would take a thousand swings. I mean, I'm not kidding you. I would take like a thousand swings on a weekend. That would be my goal in season. You know what I mean? And, and I'm in college and some of my buddies in college are like, man, slow down. Mm -hmm. I'm like, slow down. No way. I, I need, you know, I, and then you go through it and you start to say, yeah, I don't need a thousand. Maybe take a hundred championship ones um, or 50. Or 20. So what I learned in my, one of the many things I learned in my college experience, like every day in high school, in practice, I would stay after and hit and I'd grab a different teammate or two to try to, you know, bring the team together and do some things. And, and so I'd get a different guy or two. And sometimes guys would be multiple days, but you, you would build camaraderie that way. I'd get to know guys. We'd, we'd compete. So I had different games. I had a great freaking imagination, man. I'd create, mm -hmm. we'd use those little thunder sticks you know, the skinny thunder sticks, yeah. we'd hit line drives. We would do, you know, I had all these sequences where, you know, the first four, you got to hit and run. The next ones, you got to hit ground balls. The next ones, you got to hit fly balls. And, and I I'd do all that stuff. So we'd get guys competing, but you start to realize in college, a couple of my buddies who were hard workers were like, man, you don't have to hit every single day. And they're right. You don't. And so 
what I try to do with our kids is we try to equip these high school kids, be your own best coach, know yourself and advocate for yourself. So maybe you, what is your pregame routine? That can be different than mine. You know, I like to carry a tee with me and hit off the tee. You know, in high, when I was in high school, we didn't hit before the game. Well, I was like, you kidding me? I am. <laughs> I want to warm up. So I brought some wiffle balls in my tee, and I'd go hit. And I'd find a fence somewhere in the, whatever park we were at, and I'd hit. And then a couple guys would join me. And, you know, but it didn't make me better than it was just my preparation. And I knew that. Now, good for me, right? What was yeah. bad for me was I didn't have the skill set that a lot of our guys do. So it wasn't bad. They didn't. They went in and usually performed a lot better than I was, but just what I needed to get myself ready. So we try to equip our kids with start to know who you are. Um, and we're so we want to make it enticing for the kids. However, there's some things where you have to draw lines. This is not pick up baseball. We are not going to go out and wing it. We are going to know what we're doing. And, and I believe wholeheartedly that the game slows down when you know what you're doing. You can slow the game down when you know what you're doing. Uh, pressures when you don't know what you're doing pressures when you're not prepared and so we are going to be prepared and if we get beat because we make mistakes that's going to happen if we get beat because we're not prepared if that's if that's what we're okay with you're going to have a different coach because I'm not okay with that and so you know we go at it at pretty hard that way and so some kids might choose like yeah that's too tough for me and that's okay it's anything that's special not everybody can be a part of but we don't try running kids off because we're special we try mm -hmm. to say, man, this isn't for everybody, but here's what we do. We're going to go to a brewer game this year. You know, we're going to we're going to play competitive games. We're going to do this. We're going to play a good schedule. We're going to eat a lot. You know, we always joke around. We love to eat yeah. and I love to eat with the team because that's how you break barriers down, man, is you visit and you get to know each other. And food is a great barrier breaker. Um, and and we're going to take care of the field together. And we're going to help each other out. And, you know, we're going to have mothers out on Mother's Day, you know, in and around Mother's Day to bring them out to be with you when we say the lineup because your mothers are special. And rarely do they get to walk on a baseball field before a game with their son and give their son a kiss before. And so we don't do it every game, and we're not going to get into that every game. But by golly, when it's Mother's Day, we're going to do that. And so there are different things that we – and, and, again, we're always evolving and always growing and trying to get better and more efficient. But we try to – have everything align in our program. And so our goal every year is, and we try to talk to our guys about this, and we have a parent meeting next week, next Monday. It's not about winning another state championship. Of course we want to. Of course we want to win another conference championship. Of course we want to go to another sectional. Sectional day is special. It's a super fun day. We get food. You hopefully get to play two games. Hopefully you win the second game so you get to celebrate going to the World Series or going to the state tournament. But you hear on – the Super Bowl, you hear these guys with the Super Bowl talking about the real memorable moment is the AFC or NFC championship game that you win to go to the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl is kind of a blur. You know, I just was listening to Sean Alexander on a Sports Spectrum podcast, and he was talking about this. I heard about half a dozen guys talk about it before the Super Bowl saying it's the championship is cool because you know you're going to the biggest game and you get to celebrate that with you guys. Mm -hmm. But then the Super Bowl gets infiltrated with all these things and all the media and everything else. And it's just such a circus that it's almost over before you know it. And if you win, yeah, that becomes the most memorable moment. If you lose, that's like, holy cow, what a, what a low time. Mm -hmm. um, and so sectional day is cool. But, but what we try to do, what we say and we tell our guys, we talk about this throughout the whole year. Our goal is to get in the bookstore, the same bookstore. If you're on the Barnes & Noble in Maryland and I'm on the Barnes & Noble in Appleton, we're a long way away. And then we got to get to the same section. So I prefer sports books, leadership or Christian faith type books or the magazine section with like sports memorabilia and the latest uh, baseball America. Okay. <laughs> but we got to get in the same section and then we got to find the same author and then we got to get in the same book. And then we got to find the same chapter. Then we got to get on the same page. Then we got the same paragraph and then the same line and then the same word. And that is a daunting challenge yeah. to try to get, 15 or 18 or however many guys you have on your roster to get on that. Um, Cause it's an everyday grind to try to get to know each other, to try to be communicative with each other of what you're unhappy about or what you're happy about or what you need or what you don't need. And every practice should be designed in part to your personal development and in part to our team development. And it should show in our practice plan that you're going to get better as an individual and we're going to get better as a program. And so we talk about that as well. If, if, if your goal is to be the best player you can be and to help us be the best program we can be, we're going to have very few. We're still going to have issues. 
I've been married for almost 25 years. My wife still and I have some disagreements, but they're very, very short lived because of the relationship we have. And so it's going to be very short lived because we have the same goals and best player, best program. As soon as those get out of whack, you don't care about yourself. You're going to be lazy and you're going to let the program down. If you only care about yourself, you're going to have some big time issues. Um, So just aligning all of those things and then having the common vocab to say, we have to know what we mean when we say hustle. We have to have the same definition. We have to have the same definition when we say, what's a quality at bat. There's eight ways to have a quality at bat in our program. Um, What are they? It doesn't mean we're the only right one. There might, you know, Vanderbilt might have a different definition of quality at bats. This is ours. And, and so we go through that stuff and that's an arduous deal, you know, every year to get, and as you get longer into the season and you get more cohesive, it's what breaks your heart when the season ends. Mm-hmm. And you feel like, oh man, so much work to just continue to get to that. But it's, it's the, it's the joy of doing what we do. Uh, for, for sure it is. I mean, I love, I love, like you said, because it really just shows how important it is with the store down to the word. I think that's a great, it's a great visualization of it. Um, common vocabulary. When you get to that point, I'm looking at, is that where the unity council comes in or is that something you bring in everybody and you kind of do that when you're kind of creating this common vocab? Are you doing it just with the unity council? That's something you're breaking into the whole team. Breaking into the whole team. So we made a change to that this year. What we used to do is we have all our words that we felt were important. And so that's everything from a, a hustle, right? Or, you know, to, to a baseball specific word. Okay. Um, quality at bat or, um, you know, uh, halfway. How do we define halfway base runner? We're going to yell it out a lot. How do we define hitting approach? How do we defi- define a n- whole number of words? And so what we used to do is have all those words down and then kids would, would talk about which ones they don't know. Well, what we switched this year and this, you know, this is the first time in 50, whatever, 15 years since we started doing common vocab or maybe 12 years, we, we give them the definition. I'm not going to leave it to chance anymore. Um, that's, you know, they do a pretty good job of asterisking. We put them in groups and do some different things with older guys and younger guys. And we do a lot of stuff as a whole program, but now we, we define them. Now, if I were just starting as a coach, I mean, I didn't do this. I did not do this my first year or three of coaching, but I would, I would start that with their unity council. And when I, as an athletic director, when I work with some of our new coaches, I, I almost, I don't mandate that they do it because they have to own their own program, but I highly encourage that they choose out what words are most important to them and then have their leaders in their program define what that word means. What does commitment mean? What does team mean? What does fun mean? Um, you know, and I, that was the, my first year of coaching um, when I coached at Oshkosh North, I took over a program. I think they won like one game in three years. And I knew it was going to be a problem because uh, I had come back to Wisconsin. I had volunteered in this program. And it was not in a good situation. And I applied for the job anyway. It was where I was teaching. And I was like, man, I'm not positive I want to apply. But I did. Um, And I'm not trying to be overly dramatic by any stretch. You know, I'm just saying it was not in good shape. Guys would come to practice when they wanted. Miss, If it would have been my first year ever of coaching, I probably would have never coached again. Because Mm -hmm. I was just like, this is nothing I've ever even encountered. I mean, I would have been. Like even when I played wiffle ball with my buddies, I wouldn't have dealt with some of the stuff. It's like we no way, man. You gotta you gotta show up and you gotta play. And so, but I define fun and and I've kept that definition forever. And we've had one standard in our in our deal. Now our core values, our unity council creates each year and puts their own little spin on, but represent yourself, your team, your family, your school, and your community in a first class manner. And any rule that's broken breaks that rule. If you post something on social media that's poor decision, that breaks that rule. You're not representing well. If you leave your trash out when we go to eat at Portillo's, you, you broke that rule. If you are cussing in the hallway at school, you break that rule. If you leave the bus with sunflower seeds on the floor, you know we're not supposed to have sunflower seeds in the bus. And you leave sunflower seeds, A, you take them on the bus, and B, then you leave them on the floor. You know, that, that breaks that rule. And then defining fun is really critical. Fun is not, you know goofing around and, and trying to be funny. It's competitive, getting better, dealing with adversity, communicating with teammates and getting to know teammates, you know, all those types of things. And so we're on the same page. And then if somebody's not doing it, I say, hold on, here's our definition of fun. Is this what you want or is it not? And so it becomes less about 
me and you and more about what do you want to be a part of and what are you not? So I've gotten better at that too as a, as a coach. And I think being an AD has helped that. It's not you, it's your behavior. When we have a problem, it's not you, it's your behavior. Now, if you continue to do this behavior, knowing that it doesn't meet the standard, now it becomes you. And if that's who you want to be, then you got to choose this. And you don't have a choice anymore. If you make that choice, that's against our standards. You become not a part of our program by your choices. Um, so having those conversations is never easy, um, but you need to be swift and you need to be consistent in those or else the program becomes a mess and, and it, it does not uh, sustain itself over time with different p- kids of talents and different teams. So that's part of uh, that's part of the communication that's fun that our unity council does. So our unity council does not that's a long winded answer. Our unity council doesn't necessarily define all of those words, but they do define the core values and what those mean. And so they'll come up with, so we're doing that actually next week. Um, and, and, you know, we give them some samples from some colleges of, of core values and we, we give them some of our past teams if they want them. I don't make them take them, but I say, if you want to look at some of these, and then you come, every kid in that unity council comes up with four or five that they feel strongly about. And then we just go into the bunker and pull, throw them on a wall and have them try to figure out what do they want them to say and why. And so, and, and we get down to a word. Do you want it to be this word or not? And I'm sure some of them are rolling their eyes like, who gives a hoot? But <laughs> a word is important. Yes, it is. Our word, man, every word we say matters and every word we don't say matters. But even the swiftest horse can't catch the slip of the tongue. I believe that. And uh, as a parent, there are words I've said that I absolutely regret to my kids or my wife. Um, and, you know, where you just say, man, I w- wish I wouldn't have said it that way or with that tone or with that word. And and there's words that you and I probably both have heard from coaches or teammates that still cut when we hear it. Like they said that to me and I will never forget how that made me feel. And so we always want to try to make our kids feel good, um, but also without fluff. You know, I don't right. just throw you around will. just false praise to make you feel good. When, when, when we say something good to a player, like, man, you did this well. But I do love to flip the script to say, regardless of what you do, if you have the courage to come out here and compete, there are good things you're doing. So you can look at yourself. We can look at Mike Trout right now and rip him to shreds on his video if we want to. Uh, we can pick apart this and that and the other, and you know, he didn't do this. And especially if we watch multiple swings, when even Mike Trout gets off balance, not often, but he does. Um, but we can also look and say, what is he doing well? And then, you know, what what's one thing that you want to try to improve upon? And, and just having those dialogues and have them be real. And then all of a sudden, your mindset becomes that thought process. It's I'm doing this well. And, and as we all know, very few days are you going to feel awesome. Mm-hmm in every possible it's it's not going to be 82 with a slight little breeze blown out if you're a hitter and in if you're a pitcher and your <laughs> uniform feels perfect and everything went well in school and your girlfriend's happy with you and the field is in perfect shape and you're hitting second or third or whatever your ideal spot is it just you got to you got to be good when you don't feel great and that's in life too man you you're just consistent you know and 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 those people those people are people that are reliable and um and I think, you know, it's what I'm most proud about with our guys over the years is they're just solid human beings and and they, they're not afraid to be accountable for mistakes and they don't dwell on mistakes. And, you know, I, I like to think that that's kind of a trademark of our program. Yeah, it's always good. That's definitely uh, – you know you're going to be in a dogfight, you know. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's great. That's, that's it. right. Um, just, just to clarify, like you talked about, cause you think, you know, and it's, I love, you say you do it every year with grading core values. So it's not, so it's something every year that you're doing and you, t- you want it to come down to one word. So like one core value or is like the word, like the, a- is it like an acronym that would stand for your core values? I'm just trying to clarify that. Yeah. That changes every year, depending on what that, you, it's, it's more than one word. Usually we, you know, I think the most words we've ever had have been like, tw- you know, 11 or something. That's a lot. Because you yeah. want to try to live them and, and really understand them. So, you know, I try to encourage our unity council to say, you know, between four and eight core values. And then what we try to do is, is again, depending on the group and depending on how they want to. So if they say, well, we want hard work, you know, that's one of our core values. So, um, you know, I'm sure that'll be one of them this year because our slogan, we have, we have a slogan that we put on the back of our hat every year. And it's kind of our social media 
hashtag SHSH for stay humble, stay hungry. So that's been about 10 years. So everything kind of falls under that. That's been about 10 years or so we've had that with our team. We put it in the back of our hats. So it just says SHSH on the back of our hats. Mm-hmm. And if, if guys are starting to get cocky in the dugout and starting to talk trash, we just don't allow that. You can have fun and we can have fun without looking in the other dugout. We can have fun by celebrating each other. And, and in our, you know, again, I don't want to sound like the get off my lawn guy, but, you know, we don't have to put others down to feel good. We, and in our society today, it's just getting in everybody's grill all the time and acting like you're tougher than. And and I just don't I, I just don't condone that. If that's what we need to do, that's not because humility to me is two things. It's being so confident in yourself and your teammates and those around you. That you don't have to spout off about it. And the second thing is, is that you think about others. Before you think about yourself. Now, again, we spend a lot of time in our program talking about your own house has to be in order before you can take care of somebody else. So before I come on this podcast with you for an hour or hour and a half or however long it ends up being, I better be doing stuff with my family and taking care of the time that my daughters need, my wife needs and and different things. I better be getting my work done in my job. You know what I mean? And and if I'm not, that's going to crumble. But I but those are the two things of humility and then say hungry is man, just keep working. Right. And again, back to the wiffle ball analogy. We use that a lot. What's the best part of wiffle ball? If you win, I don't know about you, but I want our guys to be wired. And I'm sure, you know, just getting to talk to you a little bit, I'm sure you were wired the same way. When I played wiffle ball as a kid, it was like, you win. It's like, let's go, let's go another one. I'm going to beat you again. Just to show you how dominant I'm going to be. And if you get beat, it's like, okay, you beat me. Ah, and you're ticked off. And it's like another game. Let's go. (laughs) You know? And then the worst part is when you got called in or when you had to stop or when your buddy got called in and you got to stop. And we talk about that. The worst part of we can be upset over losses during a season, but let's not overly dwell on it. And we have an analogy in our thing. It's when the shampoo's rinsed out is when you got to move on. If you get beat and it doesn't matter enough, if we're a half hour away and we're riding the bus back and you're screwing around and jamming to your music and everything, and it doesn't hurt you enough to reflect on it a little bit and just take some time to think and then get back and take a quick shower, wash it out. And the loss goes with that. And the same with a win. If we can't enjoy the ride a little bit, and again, we don't have to be super depressed when we lose. We just got to reflect and say, man, what do we need to do better? We did lose and we're out here to win, you know? Um, That's right. And so, and so when we get back after a win, it's like, enjoy it and then wash the shampoo out and let's move on. And that's the hungry part. And, and I think that's, that's part of just being, trying to be really good every day. Um, you know, again, I, I would rather have the guy that's really good every day than the guy that's great one day and brutal for three and then a freaking superstar for one and then bad for seven. And he shows up again partially for one and then the next day a little bit. And then he's bad for six. Just give me the guy that's up there every day. Boom. And so, we, you know, that's a, another thing we do is a blue collar shirt. You know, we, we give our kids blue collar shirts like the guys in the mill or, or a mechanic who shows up every day to make sure your dad or your mom or your grandma can get to work and fix their car. Um, and he's got his lunch pail and he puts a day's work in and then he freaking goes home and he's a great dad or a great mom. And, and and then he gets up the next day and does it again. And we got to do that. We got to have that same mentality uh, when we go to work. It, it's like, let's go. We can have fun at it. And hopefully we can enjoy that process. But put that blue collar shirt on. It's a visual reminder that this is what we're about. And we're never beyond that. OK, if we think we're better than that, then we're not humble and we're not going to stay hungry. And so um, th- so work will be one of them, I'm sure. You know, being some type of teammate will be one of those core values. And then they try to give one or two little, you know, things like, how do we see this? What does this look like? So the younger guys understand this is what it looks like. And then what we try to do, if we have six of them, just say, we'll, we'll do, we'll focus on one day a week, each of them. Okay. And so they become embedded in what we do. And it's not just some page in our playbook that we say we create a core value. So we should win because of it. It becomes a living thing. How did we do this? How are we grade us out? You know, I, what I've really done a lot of over the years is try to have really quick. And I think I got this probably from being an English teacher. You know, you're out on the field. And how often do you really get to talk to kids out on the field? Not a ton. When they're playing their game of catch, I try to go touch base with them and say something. How's mom doing? I know she was sick or, you know, hey, I'm sorry that your your aunt passed away. Or, hey, man, I, you know, I saw your math teacher today. He said you're freaking doing awesome in, in class. You know, keep it up or you know, congratulations on getting the scholarship yesterday. I'm looking forward to, to when you get it, receive it in a month. 
But other than that, you're grinding, right? You're going through baseball stuff. And I want those guys to know nothing else really exists in those two hours. So what I've tried, what I started doing in, you know, in English class, we did it all the time. In class, you write something on a post-it note and give it. And then I could see where people were at. Or when they leave, you ask them a couple questions. What's one thing you're confused about? What's one thing you want to do tomorrow? Or what's one thing you hated doing today that you never want to do again? Yeah. <laughs> Anything to just get them to, to get inside their heads a little bit. And then you respond to some of those. And then they start to realize, man, this guy listens, right? He, it really is our class. This is really not about, you know, and again, one of the nice parts of being an English teacher and your social studies. So you're same boat. These are not electives. <laughs> so these kids have to be there. And my thing was every, every year, man, I say, Hey, you have to be in this class. And so my goal every single day is to make you want to come here. And then at the end, when we add all those days up, when you leave the last day of this class, I want you to say, man, if that were elective, I'm, I'm signing up. If that's an elective, I'm there. And if I, if that's not how you feel, I failed. You're great. I don't know what it's going to be. I, I'm not a big believer in grades. I'm a big, big believer in learning and getting better today than you were yesterday. Mm -hmm. And learning things that you can use. So if we're doing something here and you feel like this is freaking stupid, you got to let me know. But I don't want to hear it's stupid. I want you to tell me, man, I don't see the point in this. And let me explain and we can talk or I can ask questions, but we got to be working collaboratively. That So in baseball, I started doing that with kids. You know, what's one thing you learned in practice today? What's one thing you didn't learn? Then all of a sudden, probably about, probably about 20 years ago, I heard Ed Service talk from Creighton. And he had defensive checklists for every position. Uh, things they needed to do and, and, and kind of, so I'm like, dang, I need that. So I call him, he gives me the same type of networking you're talking about. Baseball coaches are the best. They are. He's, he's like, man, I'll send them to you. Boom. He sends them to me that same day. We've used those ever since. So a lot of times I'll say it again, and I don't know about you, but as a player, I remember saying, you know, like I got the first baseman. I'd be like, man, we haven't done pitcher cover first in forever, or we haven't done double plays with me playing behind the runner in forever. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I want my co kids to have a voice for that. So I try to at least once a week, but, but as we've kind of established our program more, I've said to kids, it is always your right to come up to us and say, coach, can we work on these things? I'm not guaranteeing we'll work on it today, but we will work it in very soon if, if we haven't done it enough. And if you have to do that a lot, we're not very good coaches. If mm -hmm. we don't touch on these things enough for, you know, I like, I believe in doing a little, a lot, as opposed to doing an hour of bunt defenses and say, we're not doing them again for a month. I like doing 10 minutes or eight minutes or 14 minutes and then, and then moving on, but doing that a lot. So they just get those quick little, little uh, works on, you know, with them. But I, I like living those core values because then it becomes part of, so how did we live that? Put that on a post-it. What question do you have about this core value or who are you seeing exhibit this really well? I like doing some things anonymously, especially at first where kids feel safe saying, Hey, Trey's not, not running out or he's not taking championship reps in the cage. And then I, they allow me to work through that to say, you know, I'm not going to call that out in front of the whole team, but I might watch you a little bit or come up to you and say, Hey, we got three teammates saying you're not doing championship reps in the cage. You know, do you feel that way or, or you feel like you're shortchanging it or whatever um, and having those conversations. So I like those index cards or post-it notes where you can take them and you can get in your side, of your kid's head for those days when you don't have five minutes to talk to every kid individually. Um, but you can still get a little nugget from them that day or, or something uh, that can help you connect with them a on a different level. That is great. I mean, I, I just love that even uh, you can just tell that the teacher part of it is just, it is, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a classroom. Um, and that's great. I, I was even thinking, I think, it, I think a great way to do it even from the, um, that you can do it in a Google form too, or you could send it out to kids and say, Hey, I want you to do this. And then you kind of put in a group chat and that could be a simple way. You know, because people might think, well, how am I going to, like, wait around and do that? Like, no, just throw it out in the chat. I mean, hey, I want you guys to fill this out before you, like, put the shampoo in your hair, you know? Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. And we, and I got to get back. That's a good call because I've never done that. We What we did over the COVID, we, we would have um, – we'd have some of these with the kids, you know, just a, yeah. a, a Zoom call. And yeah. then we'd have them put something in the comments at the end, yeah. you know, like a takeaway. And then you would have that, you know, it populate, and then you could print it off. That was powerful. But, yeah, I like that Google chat. That's a good call. Yeah, the Google form, because you'll get it all on the spreadsheet, too. Where you'll have everybody, and, you know, you could you could make they one. Jump on the, they can just jump on their phone, right, and do that? Yeah, they'd be able to do it right on their phone, and you just make it a, make it available for anyone to be able to to do it, uh, no matter what, uh, like their um, email or something. But, yeah, that would be a quick way, and that way you would see them all, and then they have their name already populated, then you'd be able to 
you know, sort it by name or whatever, or however you want to sort it. But yeah, that could yeah. work. I'm just thinking of just like for me, it's always a matter of like, okay, I'm not going to implement that. What's like, okay, well, I could do it like this where I'm like, all right, well, you know, before you get in your car, you know, as you're going this, you know, throw it, you know, do your reflection sheet or you know, whatever it is, like your exit ticket out, you know what I'm saying? Before yeah, you get right. Exactly. That's what it is. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, that's when the other cool. thing we've done, we've done a lot of that I love. You know, this is again, this was a shortcoming early in my coaching career. Is I always cared about kids' health, you know, obviously, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but from an arm standpoint, I didn't talk about that a lot because I didn't get, want kids to get paranoid about it. So I wouldn't walk around and say, Hey, Trey, how's your arm feel today? Mm -hmm. uh, but I would make clear a couple times a year, like, you guys need to let the coaches know if you're having some soreness. If your arm's not feeling good, you got to let us know. Well, you know what? Most kids aren't going to let you know. They're either going to throw less, and then you're going to get ticked at them because they're not going full speed. You know, and so finally it evolved, and I was like, you know what? This is crazy, right? And then I would start asking every day, and then it was like one kid would say, oh, man, it's all right. What does all right mean? And then another kid would be like, ah, it's, it's fine. It's okay. It's sore. I don't know if I could throw. And you'd be just like all these different answers. So we we – you know, talk about defining and common vocab. Yeah. Five is your arm is great. Four, it's good. Three, it's tired. Two, it's sore. And one, it's pain. And so every, almost every day after a game of catch, we just say, boom, you know, boom. You say three, four, five, four, four, three, two. Whoa, hold on. See me when we're done. Three, four, 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 four. You know, it takes 30 seconds to get through 18 guys. You know what I mean? And it's just, it's such a healthier way to bring it. Because, you know, we say, man, we are going to, we are going to take care of your arm so we can use your arm. We aren't going to baby mm -hmm. your arm. We're going to take care of it. We're going to do the J bands. We're going to do some plyo ball stuff and we are going to throw and we're going to play long catch. And you got to listen to your body and everybody's catch is different. How far you want to go today, you know, is different. If you're an infield or outfielder is different. If you're a catcher, sometimes that's different. If you're a pitcher and infield and you just threw yesterday, your game of catch is going to be a little different. So we're not going to script out the whole game of catch for you. And everybody's got to play the exact same way. But when we're done, we're going to get your number. And and then then we can have, then if it's a two or one now we gotta have you know if it's a one now we got problems if right. it's a two we gotta talk through that and so that's sore maybe that means you need a longer game of catch or maybe that means you shut it down for today so that's been been such an upgrade man when we've done that it's just it's like man those are you know there's so many things that as you you're like why did I do that like 15 years ago how hard is this you know for sure well that's even like because like everybody perception of those things the word fine is different too you know what I mean yeah no doubt. So I think that was really huge, even just even getting on the same page with what does that what what is that like what that one through five scale of arm arm strength or that's how my soreness is. It's really, really good. Yeah, so it becomes a positive instead of a negative because right. You know, sore for sore for some is really tired. Mm -hmm. So you can have a conversation that kids like, oh yeah, really, it's just tired. Well, they're scared. You know, they're 14 and it's the first time there's our, you know, you think about it, you go from 13 years old to being a freshman. It's the earliest they start. It's the most they do. You know I mean? So that stuff has been, has been awesome. And it, and it helps kid. it helps us support the kids rather than, ah, what are you saying? It's tired. You know that, you know, it's just, it becomes such a more positive and everything we can do to help build positive relationship uh, is we, we have to try to do that. We can't leave any stone unturned. And so the stay humble, stay hungry is just as necessary for me and our coaching staff as it is for the freshmen, you know, that we need to be humble. We need to listen to our kids when they have a complaint, um, you know, and then, and then we got to process it and, and communicate back in some way, shape or form. And, and that's not always easy to do. You know, I like to think I'm a pretty humble guy, but man, there are times you put your guards up. You're like, hold yeah. on here. How yeah. dare you question how we do this? You know, I've done this and this and this, and I've done these clinics. And I've talked to these people and I'm dang. Well, that's not the point. The point is you got to meet kids where they're at and get them to where you need them to be. And, and sometimes they need to get us where we need to be too, you know? And so we got to take heed of that as well. Amen. Absolutely. Oh man, that's great. So good. Uh, just the common definition, the communication part is so good. It's so good. I think there's a lot of value there, man. I really do. Um, there's a tremendous amount of that. You also talked about the practice plan. So I'm, I'm assuming as much as you like to communicate too, like you're 
you're communicating the practice plan up front and uh, how much you're planning out the practices. So I'd love to dive into maybe some of that. And then like, kind of like your, like things that you said, like, oh, man, I wish, where was this at like 15 years ago? You know, like, where have you seen like practice planning? How's that kind of evolved? Yeah. You know, we've always communicated our plan to the players, but a lot of times early in my career, um, what I would do, what I would just tell guys, here's what we're doing. Well, we know most guys are visual for them to be able to look at it. So, um, so I, I typically don't send the players practice plan that day because we tell our players, man, we got, I got practice plan for the whole year, but it's going to change because I have no idea what we need Tuesday, May 12th. Now yeah, I have it down. I have a skeleton plan of that because we go through and when do we want to do bunt defenses? I mean, week one, we're not dealing too much with bunt defenses. Okay. We might go through it for 10 minutes and just talk about here's what they are, but we're not going to walk through it or anything until week two, week one, we want to install our hitting approach. We want to do this. We want to do that. You know, we want to do a little bit of base running. And again, we want to do a little, a lot. So when are we going to circle back to it is big, but so I don't, I don't typically send them the practice plan because I'm changing it the night before and the morning of (laughs) because of last night's game or because of, you know, something that, that, is coming up that I just have a better idea of or because of the weather. Um, but we always post it and we post it before the kids get out there. So when they walk in the dugout, they can look at it and start getting their mind right. And then a lot of times we like to just take two minutes and we'll just lay them on the grass and just let them breathe and, and put their hat over their eyes. And if they want to try to fall asleep for two minutes, they can do that just to clear their mind. Because again, what we try to get, what we try to get um, across to our kids is when we're here, this is sacred time this time together is special. Um, and so we can't let anything hijack that. And it doesn't mean that your mom and dad going through a tough time in their marriage right now is not important. It is way more important than a baseball game, but this should be hopefully your getaway. Mm -hmm. And so we got to clear all that stuff out and be present for your teammates and for yourself. And so that time at the start of practice is helpful. We don't do that every day. But we try to do that a lot. And if we don't do it, and then we then we usually get up and we either before that or right after that, share our attitude of gratitude. Um, just let everybody know we're, we're excited to be together. Uh, we're excited to get going. And then it's their time to stretch and, and get warmed up and do their dynamic and their J-band. And then uh, their game of catch. And again, everything adding up, we, we, we value every part of that. Um, and so when we, we give award stickers to their helmets after games, you know, that they get to put on their helmets. And one of those things is from when either they show up at the park to their game of catch uh, and then their game of catch and then the pregame and then the game and then the post game, which is cleaning up the field or getting on the bus and the bus ride back. We got to win all five of those phases of the game. And so what message that sends to our kids is winning the actual game is one fifth of the process. And so if we do a poor job when we show up and guys aren't setting up what they're supposed to do or they're late or we have a click over here talking to each other and we're not all together uh, or we drive the bus back and we're acting like buffoons and we have the sunflower seeds on the ground or whatever, you know, that's we lose that game. So nobody gets a sticker. We might have won 15 to nothing. We might have had a great pregame and the three scouts that were in the stands now want to make three of our players second round draft picks. None of that matters if we can't take care of the stuff that we have most control over. You know, and so those are things that I think um, become part of what our kids expect. They expect to see that plan. And and we I challenge them all the time. It's one of the reasons I like being an AD and a coach. I'm being challenged by our coaches a lot of am I practicing what I preach? That's right. And so I I, I stand up to that challenge all the time of I, I need to be. And if I'm not, I should be held accountable. And so when I tell our kids there's a part of practice every day that's for your development. And there's parts that are team development. And there's a lot that overlap. If we're doing a bunting game, that's improving you as a player. It's also improving our team. If we're hitting on the tees and you're just working by yourself, that's obviously predominantly player development. That's eventually going to help our team, of course. Um, But they need to know that. And if they start to see times where that's not happening, they got to speak up. And if they don't speak up, shame on them. I'm not the expert and, and the guru that can't be questioned. And our coaching staff isn't either. It has to be a continual dialogue where we're in the same boat, paddling in the same direction in that same bookstore, trying to find the book to get on the same word. 
And so, you know, those things I think foster um, communication. I think it fosters an expectation that our practice is going to be absolutely top shelf. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we're not trying to be anything more than we are. We're a high school baseball program that's trying to develop quality young men. Uh, but when you go, one of our goals, one of our several goals is not our only goal, but when kids go to play college baseball, it should not be a huge, like, oh my word. Mm -hmm. It should just be like, yeah, this is baseball. We need to know our bunt defense. We need to do relays. We need to play catch the right way. The team that plays the best game of catch is going to be in, in every single possible game uh, that they can be in. And um, so it shouldn't be a drastic change. And I say that, like when I got done coaching college baseball, I knew I wanted to be a high school coach. And so when I was showing families around campus in Cincinnati, I would take notes when I got back to my apartment because I knew I wanted to be a high school coach. And, and I was praying I would be able to be a dad at some point and that I could share that with my own kids and with um, my players. Well, when I became a high school coach, I didn't because I didn't want to make that like that was my sole goal to create college players. That is not. I have no idea how many players have played college. I think, you know, I, I think I could probably take a guess at that. I don't add that number up. Um, it's not that important to me. What I love to see is former players with their own kids and, you know, hopefully they coach their kids and hopefully they do it in a, in a way that's loving and accountable and competitive, but also loving and fostering. Um, and so, you know, th those are things that, that I think, we try to do to say, man, we're going to have, because our goal is that when you're done with our high school program in 20 years, you can look back and say, man, there might've been an equivalent experience somewhere playing for Trent Mangero or for Chan Brown or for, you know, Butch Chafin or, you know, or, or any number of outstanding high school coaches in this country, but it, it wouldn't be better. We, we got everything we could have ever expected out of this program. And then some, and uh, that's, the grind every day that, that I embrace and that my coaching staff embraces to say, this is, it's a tall task because you're trying to meet the needs of all these different kids and, and, and do all these different things within the rules of our WIA. And, you know, some of which I absolutely agree with and some I think are absolutely archaic and need to be changed like yesterday. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and, and I love, you know, we've been blessed with great travel organizations in our state with people that run them, that care about kids and yeah, it's a business. Um, and, and, but man, they're, they're quality people that I work hard and I think they work hard too, to develop a relationship so that we do best by our kids. It's not about Ryan McGinnis and how much he knows about baseball or about Greg Reinhardt or about Jason Birkin or about, you know, RJ Ferguson. Uh, it is about the kid and how they're going to have the best possible experience in baseball. So the fact that we have that here, I'm, I'm really, really excited and, and blessed with because they provide, I mean, like, you know, who wouldn't love that right in any other venue. If I'm an English teacher, again, go back to the English classroom. If someone's going at night to get tutored in reading, that's right. Would I begrudge that, you know, I'd be like, absolutely, man. And let me know what you're doing so I can help support that here too. If there's something I can learn from to, to get to you better, let me know. And it should be the same way we go about baseball. And so often it becomes a, you know, let's put each other down and say what he's doing is wrong. And, you know, not going to get you where you need to go or isn't going to help do this or that. It's like, no way, man. It's there's there are more ways to skin the cat. Let's, let's talk. Yep. Uh, more ways the kids are going to learn. They're going to learn from different ways. And especially as coaches, we're always trying to find different ways to say it. No doubt. You know, and different implements to use it. And a lot of times those travel organizations have things that we don't wrap sodos and, and just different, different facilities. You know, we're, we're blessed at Kimberly. We have a nice indoor facility that we use. Um, you know, for our uh, winter workouts and stuff, we can't work with the kids. Our coaches can't, but they can work out and, and do things. And so we're blessed with that. But shoot, to be able to go to some of these facilities and work with guys that know what they're doing mm -hmm. and study it and, and have, have, have played. And yeah, it's more voices. Um, so it's good. I think it puts the kids in a good position too to say, hey, you need to communicate. You can't be afraid of this. You got to own your own growth. And you, you know, you have to be able, and as I get older, I understand it's probably, you know, intimidating sometimes for those younger players to say, you know, this is what I learned and this is what I like to do. That's okay. It's uncomfortable for me sometimes to talk to a superior at work or, you know, somebody in a different district or whatever. And how do you get through that? You think about how you want to package your, your conversation. 
and your message and you have the conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you don't, you end up being a bitter old person down the road. Like, Oh, I should have, I knew I should have, and they do this. You got to advocate, you know? And so I love the, 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 I love the state that we're in, you know, there's a lot of info and it's, I think it's really tough to be a kid, um, in today's climate. Uh, but it, but they're going to navigate it just fine, man. Cause they're equipped to, and they know. And, and one of the things we say in our program is, you know, don't have an identity crisis. You need to know who you are. You need to know what you stand for, not just in baseball, but how do you want to be a hitter? And the only thing I get frustrated with, and I'm going to tell you as soon as I realize if, if Trey, if you're one of my guys and, and you're coming today and you have an open stance and tomorrow you have a closed stance and the next day you have this, I'm okay with that. Cal Ripken did it. Don Mattingly did it. So I, Rod Carew did it. You know, there's lots of great players that did it, but we're going to have a conversation. Tell me why, what's going through your head. I'm, I'm not saying you can't do it. I just want to understand what you're thinking so I can better help you. And if you say, well, you know, I hit like garbage yesterday, so I'm changing. No, that's not okay. You know, that's not a reason to do that, but let's continue the conversation. And so, um, you know, I, I love the, the place where our game is at. I don't love where the MLB is at right now in their conversations. I don't mean that, but I love right. where our game is at. I think there's so many great things going on and so many people that want to be involved to grow the game uh, and to make kids better. And so many kids that are willing to, to take part in it. We got to continue to make sure that number keeps going up, you know, and I hope major league baseball puts their continue or not continues, but gets back, to, gets back to putting their money into the inner city and reviving that um, and trying to make this game as affordable as possible. I would love to see them make a change in the NCAA scholarship yes. dollars and number of coaches and, and make that a stinking priority. Um, it just, it, you know, it, it would, it would help in so many ways. Um, you know, even open up games, we can see games all over the country. Oh, mm -hmm. be nice. No. Yep. Be nice. That's for sure. So speaking of that coach, like, I mean, how have you developed, uh, it sounds like, you know, you're open to technology, you're open up to like the new point where the game's at and adapting to that. So how have you been to adapt and, you know, like with technology and things that you, let's say things that you've liked with the new ways of doing things, let's say from a technology standpoint and said like, yep, I've done it that way, but I still think, you know, I've also noticed that this way is still good for me to do it. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I love both. I mean, I'm getting older, so I probably am considered old school in some ways. Um, but I think the metrics are really valuable. Um, and I think it's valuable for a couple of reasons. Um, I think it's a way to get kids to understand here's how we improve certain metrics. Now, I think what we have to have kids put a uh, connect the dots on is how do those metrics make me a better player? So just because I can throw 87 or just because my spin rate is X, what does that do? to make me a better player. How does that matter? Because my bat speed gets better. How does that make me a better player? And I think having those conversations. So being able to show kids, here's a metric. How can you improve it? How can you improve bat speed? Well, you know, one way is you can go on a weighted bat program with plyo balls or without plyo balls. And that's been around for a hundred years. Yes. I mean, there was a weight weighted bat program a hundred sinking years ago, you know? Um, and, and so if I include, increase my bat speed, how might that improve me? And a lot of kids won't come to the conclusion, well, it gives me more time to read the pitch. They're going to say, well, I can hit the ball harder. Well, really? Maybe, but not if you're not hitting it. If you're swinging and missing, you know, 67% of the time, doesn't do you a whole lot of good. But being able to allow the ball to travel more, that is going to help me make better decisions. And my strike zone discipline is going to be better. And we know that the best hitters, the separator in Major League Baseball or any level of baseball, we look at these guys hitting 220 in the big leagues it's like, let's not forget they're one of the best 500 players in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's not – they're 220 is be, usually because their strike zone discipline is not as good as the guy hitting 290. Mm -hmm. um, or I like to go better by quality of bats rather than a batting average. But your quality of bats are less because um, your strike zone discipline is different. But I like using those numbers, and I like looking at it as this. There's a puzzle to put together. And, and the puzzle, when it's put together, has the best player – for his team. And part of that puzzle is, are some of those metrics you can't really measure. What's your grit? What's your resiliency? Uh, how, how well can you play one pitch at a time? 
how well can you adapt when someone hits a ball off the wall and you can make that next pitch or when the umpire doesn't give you this pitch and can you come back with the next one? That's not as measurable as what's my velo or what's my 60 yard dash. I still am flabbergasted that that's what baseball uses predominantly is a 60 yard dash as opposed to a 30, you know, right. or the home to first time. It's just like, wow. It's the home the first time. I mean, like, Dang come right. on. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I like putting all those together and then taking those, you know, letting kids understand what all that means. And every kid's a little different, you know, and I understand from the player I was that it is scary sometimes to see those numbers. Like I went to wanted to see my VLO as a pitcher in high school. Um, but I believed in my heart I could get guys out. You know what I mean? Um, and so I like putting all that together and saying, let's let's use it for the better. And I think it's most important to do in the offseason, just like in the weight room. You know, now I'm not talking about the game metrics. I mean, what's the pop time and what's the pitcher's time to home plate? And then what's my time as a base runner from a lead at 13 feet to go to second base? And then we do the math and say, man, I don't even have to get a great jump and I'm safe. Right. I'm running. So those are all metrics we're going to use in game. We're going to use velocity. And when your velocity drops off for the opposing pitchers, velocity drops off. How do we know that? What do we see? Um, what does that mean? Um, and, you know, some of those kinds of things are important. What's the speed of every runner? We need to know the speed of every runner on every team in our conference and any other team that's on our schedule. We need to know that now. Um, but I'm talking about my bat speed and, you know, what's my velo from the outfield and, and what's my – how am I going to increase my time from home to first or, or stealing, you know, that that's when we train. And when we're doing that, we need to have some real motivation to do that um, and how we train so that we're training in a championship manner. And so I like using it, you know, the rap Soto. Um, I think there's some good numbers there for kids. I think, I think what we owe to our players, the rap Soto numbers and some of those new numbers off of hit track and stuff. I think that's more to give credible info to colleges. So our kids can be recruited. Mm. you know, for me to say, Hey coach, I mean, I, I feel like I trust my eyes and I know what I'm talking about. And I do this and I call a coach and I think I have a decent network of coaches that trust my word, but it's not as good as saying, here's the deal. You know, yes. here's what rep Soto had him at. This Here's a video with it there. Yep. That's right. So I think just understanding that part of it is essential for us so that we can help our kids find the best fit for them. And, uh, and I think, you know, each year I've gotten a little bit better at, at helping um, our kids. You know, I've tried always, like I said, I took those two years, my first two years of coaching high school. I was like, I'm not going to do that. And I was like, what, what am I doing? Let's, let's just tell our guys, Hey, I'm going to help you whether you play baseball or not. But if you want to go play baseball, I can help you find the right fit if you want my help. Mm -hmm. And so I've enjoyed doing that. And uh, it's been something that I think, you know, our guys have appreciated and, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's not my decision. It's just my chance to help them find the best fit. Um, and so, you know, just working through that process, because kids look at you like, I don't know what the best fit is. Nobody does. It's the first time most of us in our life are going off and living on our own. Mm -hmm. Most kids have not gone to live on their own throughout their lifetime. And so um, what is the best fit? So we have this long questionnaire that kids go through and they don't have to answer it. But it's to try to get them, what do you what do you value? Do you value what type of city it is, what how class sizes are, what the baseball program is, who the coach is, what the majors are at that university, how far from home you are, what the dorms are like, what the social aspect is like. I mean, you got to figure out, like, yeah, that matters, that matters, that matters. And then now you can find the right fit. And uh, if we're doing anything less than that, I think we're just throwing darts in the dark. Um, and so – you know, kids working through that process, I think, is a really valuable component to them growing as a person to understand who they are and what they want. Mm. Wow. So just a ton of stuff. I mean, I love that. The best fits, even just to, even for them just to get through thinking about that. I think that's a great even process for them to go through it with their parents um, and just have that whole conversation. Because, yeah, like from money to like you said, staying close to home or competing at a higher level or putting themselves in the biggest competition possible, you know, like, so it's just great for them to even start thinking about that. And hopefully they're having this conversation with the people surrounding them. That's going to be part of that decision as well. Well, Super especially cool. you being, you know, and you can empathize with this for sure is, um, you know, the, the Juco world is so misunderstood mm -hmm. um, on who that's for and what value that brings. And so, just like any other level of college baseball, it's not for everybody, but it sure offers a huge value 
to certain people. And, um, you know, we have two kids going JUCO this year to Madison Area Tech, which is an awesome baseball school with, a you know, an outstanding coach. Um, and, you know, it's an hour and 30 minutes from here. It is just going to be a – it's a perfect fit for these two guys because they're both really good. They're kind of under-the-radar guys. Um, one's a pitcher, and he's going to flourish. Uh, and this coach – he's going to give them opportunities. He, you know, it's not 80 guys on the roster. He's going to get opportunities. He's going to get coached. He's going to develop. And then the other kids are positional who just kind of got caught in that COVID deal, mm-hmm. you know? And, and so he's going to an environment where he's going to get coached. He's going to compete in this kid's competitor. He's an athlete. He can absolutely fly. He's a grinder. He's just, it's just, so you got to work through because the, the misconception a lot of times is, well, that's just for kids that don't care about school. Oh no, it's not. Mm-mm. You're going to save money. You're going to get the same credit. They're all going to transfer. You know, if you do your homework the right way and not homework, the schoolwork, but if you do your homework on what classes you're taking, they're all going to transfer. Yep. Um, and so you break those walls down. And so that that's where that best fit. We, and then parents are like, really? And then kids are like, really? Oh, wow. Well, let me look into it. Then you have conversations. They have conversations. They start to realize, wow, that's pretty cool. You know? Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it's just a, it's really a healthy way to go about it because again, just like everything else it adds up and kids start to see, Oh yeah. Like, I don't think they ever think I'm trying to make the decision for them, but they start to realize like, this is my decision. Like, this is crazy. You know, I'm not ready to make it. No. And nobody is when they're 18, No, but you, but everyone, everyone that has, has lived to tell about it. And so you need to make it so that you can look in the mirror if it's the wrong one and say, this is on me and I'm going to transfer. And that's happened a ton of times, right? Millions of kids have transferred over the last 50 years and and you're going to be just fine if you have to the goal is not to but if you need to you need to you can only you can only know if you try man and you got to just go in and and own the decision and but make sure you do the homework so you can say this is why i made it no different than if if we make a call in a game and it doesn't work sometimes you beat yourself up sometimes i beat myself up i got to make sure i take two showers because i don't always live by when the shampoo comes out it's very true but i will always have a reason why and then you can always come back and say, well, maybe that was a bad reason why, but it was a reason why. I mean, you know, so, uh, you know, we stole a base last year in a game that was a spot I would never, ever have thought I would have stole a base in a game. And we did it for three reasons and didn't work. I got thrown out, you know, and it got thrown up by about a mile. But the reasons I did it, I'm, I'm comfortable with. And, and I felt we needed to do it to do something at that point in the game. And I was I would have bet you my house the kid was throwing a breaking ball. That was number one. And he threw a freaking fastball. And I was like, I couldn't have been more shocked. And then the catcher put the ball right on base. And you know what? I, I, I kicked myself, but that's part of the deal, man. And if if you're going to be you know, courageous enough to be in the third base coaching box making signs, you better be courageous enough to make a mistake. And, and I am. And I'll never back down from that. You know, And our kids feel that, I think. And, and so they're not afraid to make mistakes. And nothing makes me prouder of a kid when he's all in, man, and not afraid to fail. Uh, Cause that takes courage and, and that takes guts and, and it takes a trust in your team that they're going to still love you. Amazing. This has been awesome. has been awesome. Really appreciate it, coach. Um, shoot, we're here almost two hours. Um, getting after it. I would say, I would say <laughs> just thinking about this here, if anybody would want to, before we maybe go on to something else, want to reach out to you about some of the stuff that you've been talking about. Cause I think you have a lot of great things that maybe some people might want to like touch base with you. What might be the best way for people to contact you? Um, either my cell phone or my email. Okay. So you, you have my cell, I think. Yeah. Cause you texted me. I can give you that if you need it. Yeah. Go ahead. That'd be the best way. Nine, two. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Five, seven, Oh, yep. three, three, six, nine. Okay. And then email is R. McGinnis, M-C-G, I-N-N-I-S, at Kimberly. That's with just K-I- L-Y? Yeah, right, yep. Dot K-1-2, dot W-I, dot U-S. So our McGinnis at Kimberly, dot K-12, dot W-I, dot U-S. I'm just thinking about checklist and thinking about the, the, the good fit. I love that one. I love that, uh, the good fit. I'm thinking about, um, just a handful, handful of things. 
um, that people might want to reach out and thinking about because it was just a uh, really good. Um, even before we roll, I think if there anything that we might not have covered that you feel needs to be said or something you'd like to mention before we kind of wrap things up here. Um, you know, I really appreciate what you're doing. I think the beauty of coaching is continual growth. And I think just the, I think I've listened to, you know, five of, of yours already. The, you know, Chan's was the hundredth. I was like, holy man, I got some work to do here. But I, I just, I appreciate what you're doing because I think it's the right work. Um, you know, it, and it says it in your title for sure. Um, so I just think as, as we, as we coach, I think we need to keep both of those things in mind because it's easy to get sucked into the winning, you know, in today's deal of, you know, unless you can show the nine state championships you've won, you're not worthy of, of my son's time. You know, that's not what it's about, man. It is about the process every step of the way. And, um, and if we don't, I think if we don't instill that in our kids, that it is the process, man, it is the journey. Um, and that's thrown around a lot today, you know, in, in a very, uh, maybe insincere way, but that is the absolute heart of what we do um, in life. It's the journey. It's the people we meet. It's the laughs we share. It's the tough times we grow closer to each other in. Um, and, and that's what we need to stand for as baseball coaches. And every second of that, we're trying to win games. But but never should winning games trump that process. And uh, and that's something we have to just anchor ourselves to. So I thank you for for what you're doing, man. It's good stuff. And, and hopefully we'll keep in touch. You know, I'll, uh, I'll reach out to you maybe with some questions and, and some things that, that you do too. I enjoyed what you shared early on. How great was that? Coach McGinnis just giving us all kinds of information, stuff to help us with the communication part of things. Talk about great practice plans, being a great teacher. The exit tickets, right? The exit tickets for what the kids are learning. Um, I know off the air too. We talked about how he even gets into like what they're excited about, what they're looking forward to, and what they're worried about. A great thing to even break into. Look, take the ch- pulse of your team, checking in with guys, understanding that this this guy does really care. And again, like we all know. They don't know how much you know until they know how much you care. They just don't. It's just such a, a added value, and I think that's another great tangible way that we all could use that into helping our programs. Um, so just those things. Um, very reflective himself about, am I practicing what I preach? Am I doing that? So uh, using his his form of leadership as him being the leader of his athletic department and being reflective of, am I practicing what I'm preaching to my coaches and what he's trying to do in his athletic department uh, is very valuable. You can see that that's the kind of leader that people are going to follow, people are going to um, work for. Uh, I just, um, you know, you love his adaptability, willingness to share different things, his defensive checklists. Um, and again, the defining the arm soreness, which again is coming down to his common, his common vocab, but scale of one to five, be clear, making it very common of like, here's how we're going to talk about when we talk about our arm soreness. Hey, how's your arm feeling? I'm feeling fine. Here's your arm feeling. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling strong because you're oh, a little tired. What does it mean? Let's all get on the same page. Um, because it's, uh, another great thing I talked about was it's not you, it's your behavior. But again, if your behavior continues, then we have to make adjustments, but it's not you, it's your behavior. This is about behavior, and we're all, leaders said that's what it is. It's about can we manage behaviors, can we influence behaviors and get the behaviors to get on the same page. And Coach McGinnis does a great job of trying to get all those behaviors in line and, and has a great system for doing that, which from his unity council and the uh, the definitions that you're using for their common language, things like that to make sure that people are aligned. Like he said, he wants all things aligned in his program for what they're trying to do. So really great stuff. Uh, Coach McGinnis, I can't thank you enough. and can't thank you guys for holding on with us here. I know this was – we could have went for a while, and we still did, <laughs> even afterwards. Uh, again, I appreciate you, Coach McGinnis, and all this stuff, and I can't wait for the next time that we talk. And everyone, I thank you. Appreciate you hanging on here. 
here it is, 102nd episode. Um, really thankful for, for this one here, and thankful for the next one we're going to be able to have, keep having. So, again, thank you for the feedback. Thank you for sticking with us. Thank you for the support. Keep it coming. Let me know anything that we can do better, any feedback we have. Uh, and if anything that you feel is a guy that's right for us, we're gonna get that we can learn from. Love to have him. So again, reach out at Trey T Cobb, gmo.com, Twitter's Coach Three Cobb, or the BMBB podcast. So, until next time, keep getting better.